No my hi to my. Welcome to the More Than Theology podcast. Kia ora. Welcome to More Than Theology. Uh, my guest today is Taryn Dreifel. Taryn is currently a PhD student studying theology through the University of Otago. She works for Laidlaw College where she did her master's degree in theology. Uh, she's also a secondary school teacher and um, has some really interesting perspectives on uh, Maori perspectives on community uh, that I really want to dig into uh, with her. So welcome Taryn, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Cool. Uh, so you are obviously got an intellectual interest in things like whāngai, uh, Māori adoption, um, k- Māori perspectives on community, but there is also a personal story behind that and a very personal interest. Can you just tell us a little bit about growing up and your experiences and background that have kind of led you into this area of research? Yeah, so um, I am Māori mm-hmm. and Pākehā, um, but I didn't really um, grow up with much Māori culture. Mm. Uh, it, it was a bit of a journey for me as an adult to try and find some of those roots. And um, part of that journey was um, when uh, I was in my mid-20s, uh, my husband and I um, adopted a little girl who was um, seven weeks old. It's our daughter. And um, then about a year later, we adopted her brother. And then a couple of years later, we adopted <laughs> their other brother so um we've got these these three kids that we're raising as well as our natural child and um I think when they were uh, really young um we were thinking a lot about um you know they they fuck a papa maori as well um mm. and they're from the same enemy as me and um thinking a lot about how do we raise them um culturally mm. and uh, how do we do this adoption thing what do we believe about this what is you know what should we be doing here and how do we do it really well and um so I think you know around the time I was um finishing my uh, undergrad and sort of looking at postgrad studies I was um you know you're in that time where you're trying to think about what you might want to research and what you're going to kind of commit to and there's all these questions between me and my husband about, you know, how do we do this well? How do we, um, you know, like just even really practical stuff, like when do you tell the kids? When do you have that conversation about where they came from? And, um, you know, do you keep it a deathbed confession or do you um, make it nice and open the whole time? And, and how do you have those conversations? So uh, I think it was around that time I was kind of looking at postgrad and I thought, you know, this is something I actually need to research, um, not just academically, but, you know, to be able to, be really great parents we need to really look into how to do this properly and obviously um, you know when you're trying to live out of a Christian faith you also want to do it really well theologically and make sure that you're doing the best you can so um, I kind of came up with this idea of um, let's you know for my masters I'll have a look at um, what what the bible tells us about adopting children and what Maori culture says about adopting children and and whether um, you know those two can can come together and um, make some sort of framework that we can raise the kids under. Mm. And um, so that's that's kind of how it all started. Mm. So can you explain in a kind of nutshell, what is whāngai? Yeah, okay. So um, whāngai um, uh, linguistically means to feed or nourish. Um, but it's, um, so like, it's got a really rich meaning, but the practice of it is around caring for kids. So obviously you want to feed them and you want to nourish them, but you want to do that in every sense of the word. Um, and so, um, in Maori culture, the, um, the idea of, the idea of raising children is not, um, is not like a, an individual thing. It's not his two parents and here's their child and they're going to raise that child. It's more like um, we've got a child and your child in the community and so um, we're all going to make sure that that child uh, is looked after because that child is our responsibility but also an asset to us as a community. And so um, the idea of whāngai is that when there's a children, uh, a child that um, that needs care, it's a it's a community decision about how to do that, and so you're you know you're going to talk to the parents, but you're also going to talk to the wider Fano, and then sometimes that's at a more hapu or iwi level, and um, you know so for our children um, that was sort of an iwi placement, and it was you know there's a need there, and we're going to sort out how that's done. So um, so whāngai, I mean at its most basic is just Maori cultural adoption of children, but it's so much 
um, richer than that. There's so much within it. Mm. So it's it's much less about the nuclear family. Like if you were to compare it to sort of, um, I guess a Pakia kind of framework for adoption, it was that the kind of co- key difference. It's less about the nuclear family and more about the the wider Fano the community, wider community. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the reasons for Fangai are very different. Um, you know, my masters, I, I did like a side by side comparison of Western um, understandings of adoption in New Zealand, and then how Fangai is practiced. And you know, um, when we look at adoption, um, especially if you look in like popular culture, you know, shows like Friends and Glee um, sort of show childless couples who really want a baby and so they go onto some kind of long waiting list hoping to be picked and yeah. um, the reasons behind Fangai are completely different it's not really I mean about infertility so much or what the parents need or even what the child isolated needs it's about what everybody needs oh, yeah. so it might be that you know there's a child and the parents are a little bit young and they're going to need a bit of support and there might be um, a sibling who doesn't have any kids and she'd like to raise one and or um, it might be about uh, an older uh, family member who's got a lot of knowledge they want to pass down and they want to make sure that they get to do that um, to somebody young who's going to take responsibility for that information. Or, you know, there's all kinds of reasons why a child might um, go into a fungi placement, mm-hmm. whereas um, I feel like the Western adoption side of things is much narrower. Um, I definitely think we've focused a lot around you know the idea of childless couples and um and orphans and things like that mm, yeah cool okay so that was your master's uh research yes and now you're doing phd research which kind of builds on that but is broader right so just tell us a little bit of how that your research interests have evolved yeah okay so um the master's looked at the two institutions and then ultimately argued that um they're not comparable at all because they have completely different concerns. Mm. Um, the concerns for Western adoption are super individualistic, um, which is sort of standard under Western models. Yeah, sure. um, and then the um, Māori whangai uh, adoption is much more community focused. And so um, I, I argued at the end of my master's that um, having looked at um, what's in the Bible about adoption and what theology has to say about mm-hmm. adoption, that um, adoption is a adoption in the Bible and theologically is actually a really community focused thing as well. Um, it's very relational, and so um, I argued that Maori understandings of adoption are much closer to a biblical and theological understanding of adoption than how we are practicing adoption in the West. Mm. So, um, because I kind of came to the, that conclusion toward the end, I felt like um, there was this like burgeoning area which I had sort of concluded but not really gotten into so the PhD was a very natural progression from that because what I wanted to do then was sort of step back and go okay let's look at those really wide understandings then what does it mean that um that Māori have community understandings of everything and what does it mean that biblical and theological adoption is community-based so the PhD looks at um a Canadian guy Stanley Grins um, who has built um, a whole theology of community. So he's just written, um, well, he's, he's written prolifically, but uh, his main book is just a systematic theology um, that's built around the idea that everything is focused towards community. And so I'm comparing what he's put together with Māori understandings of community and trying to make those connections. Um, and then using Fangai as kind of a case study of how we see those Māori understandings of community play out in a real way. Mm, mm. Um, and putting this in conversation with Stan Grintz on um, the surface of things seems like kind of unusual, but the way you've explained it, it's that focus on community. Um, my initial thought is, you know, here's a, a white Canadian man now deceased. It just seemed like an odd connection, but when you've put it that way, it's about his focus on community. Am I right in thinking that uh, Grenz's focus is on um, the Godhead as community? Is that kind of where he works from? Yes. Yeah, so he's got a very, very relational understanding of the Trinity and everything that he sees comes out of that. So every facet of theology to him is about community, every every little part of it and um he he brings everything back to the idea that we are created 
to be in community with each other, with God, with the created order. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, even though he's um, he's not an indigenous um, person and um, he's very removed from Māori culture, um, it seems like a natural connection to me because I almost think he has seen what I tried to argue in the Masters, which is that actually there's so much more community than maybe we've picked up in the West. Um, and the other thing that makes Stanley Grimm's a really great comparison is that um, he argues that every um, that all theology should be done in conversation with culture, mm. that you can't do it, um, you know, without making those connections, showing how it can be done in the culture and the context in which you're living. And mm. so he, I think that's quite a natural um, comparison to make with the Māori understandings of community. I think Stanley Greens would love it. Mm, yeah, I'm sure he would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, tell me what, a bit about what you're discovering. as you. I know you're in the middle of your PhD research, but what are the sort of things that you're uncovering as you go? Um, yeah, I think um, it's been surprising the amount of connections I've been able to make. Um, I mean, it hasn't been done before at all. So there was a lot of pressure, I guess, that I put on myself to kind of make connections that have just that it weren't there before um but actually it's been a lot easier than I thought um there's a lot of um things where I've just I don't know um things like um Stanley Green's uh talks a lot about stewardship mm. about how um you know God is so embedded in creation that we um and we are too and so to live in community really well we need to be stewards of creation and so I can already, um, even in these early stages, start to see some connections with kaitiakitanga mm. because um, Ma- Māori would argue the same, that we're, you know, we're embedded in the created order and we have to look after it. Um, another interesting one is Stanley Grenz argues that the idea of sin is actually the breakdown of community. So anything that breaks down community he would say is sin because God ultimately wants us to live in community. Um, and so, uh, you know, looking at things like that and the violation of tapu um, and, um, you know, whangai is a perfect um, example of that because, uh, you know, when we look like in the media at the moment, there's so much about the uplifting of Māori children yeah. and um, the ways in which that breaches the treaty and things. And so, you know, I think Stanley Grenz would look at that and say, well, that's breaching community because, you know, these children are, are not being looked after under the framework that, you know, Māori would need. And so um, just those little things, I think, keep coming up, and I'm always surprised by how easy it is, mm. actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Would it be fair to say it's almost like getting um, those Pākehā lenses sort of removed or out of the way enables you to see some connections that are pr- maybe a lot clearer? You know, there's a lot... Uh, cleaner connections in some of these areas between what we see in scripture and what we see in te ao Māori. Um, rather than where, you know, there's a tendency for Pākehā, for Westerners to think like our framework is kind of the normal one, you know, and um, and there may be a little surprise when we see resonances with uh, Māori culture or other indigenous cultures. Um, but in actual fact, it's not that surprising that there's a similarity between, say, a Hebrew worldview and a Māori worldview. So what do you think um, New Zealand culture or Pākehā culture, even more specifically, could learn from what you're learning in your, um, your research about Māori perspectives on community? Mm-hmm. Um, I think, uh, you know, we need to um, f- firstly kind of look at this stuff around um adopting of children Um, I think there's a lot to learn there and I think that um, it shows a wider gap almost between the belief systems Mm. Um, you know we're a bicultural nation we've got these two well we've got multiple cultures but we've got these two dominant cultures Um, and the gap between what they believe over here and what they believe over here is really quite large for this amount of time onwards. Um, One of the things I talked a lot about in my master's was the legal frameworks around adoption. Mm. Um, Whangai has no legal framework and um, the adopting of children still operates under the 1955 Adoption Act, which is obviously really outdated and um, was made under a... um, you know, Pākehā framework. And so um, I think that we all need to be looking at how we can um, try and bridge some of those gaps. Um, I think that Māori culture has a lot to 
say to the West and that maybe we haven't always listened to that. Um, I think the fact that Stanley Grenz could come up with this really relational systematic theology um, in Canada and it resonates so much with Māori culture just shows that actually it is there, we're just not bringing the two together and we maybe need to get better at doing that. Mm, yeah, for sure. Um what is your hope that believers in New Zealand might get from this? You know, um, I know none of us that are in academia probably have any illusions about, you know, th- are selling thousands of books or any of that kind of thing. But in our sphere of influence, what are the kinds of things that you kind of hope the average Joe Christian or Jane Christian um, gets from what you're doing? Is that sort of around in that area of adoption and how we do it? What, what are the kind of practical takeaways for people? Um, yeah, I feel like... My number one concern would be adoption and how we do it um, because it's become so much bigger since I did my master's. Um, Nobody was really talking about whangai or um, the uplifting of Māori children when I wrote that and now it's in the news all the time and I think that that needs to be something that we address. Mm. Um, I think uh, we need a new legal framework um, for Māori and for babies Mm. Um, and I think we need to... um, we need to be thinking more, uh, really, about how we do things in general. Um, you know, saying about how there's those those gaps. Before I started all this postgrad work, I kind of wonder how much I really tried to do that or tried to see another way. And, um, you know, obviously it's not just the Māori cultural way. There's lots of other ways of thinking about doing things. And I don't think that we're always particularly good at trying to do that or stepping out of the box or, um, you know, listening to other people. Um, you know, people, when they find out what I research, always say to me, like, oh, what is fungi? And it's kind of um, astounding that we don't know that because mm. it's really widely practised. It's been widely practised since pre-contact. Um, so, you know, if we don't know what it is, then we can't possibly have a conversation about well, how, how do you do it then? How's that different to how we're adopting, um, you know, under the legal system? And so um, I think we need to have those conversations. We need to be willing to hear other sides of things and we need to be willing to let those things shape us mm. um, and not just sort of say, well, that's really interesting, but that's a Maori perspective and, mm. and that's not me. Mm. I'm just going to go back to what I was doing over here. Mm. Um, but, you know, how to, um, especially when I think about the amount of um, ways in which Maori cultural understandings saturate the Maori world, um, because it seems like there's this real dichotomy of how people actually live very differently in New Zealand. Yeah. And maybe... Um, you know, obviously, I'm not saying that Māori do everything right all the time, nor do Pākehā, but maybe there's some ways in which things are being done a bit better over here, and are we having those conversations? Are mm. we thinking about those things, and are we trying to actually think about how adoption could work a different way? Mm. Yeah, and one thing that strikes me about the importance of what you're doing is that because you're looking at whangai uh, and those sorts of practices theologically, you're really addressing the area of spirituality, maybe for a want of a better word, that I think secular Pākehā New Zealand doesn't really get. You know, so when you're talking about public policy, Pākehā don't normally think in theologically. Um, a lot of that stuff is implicit. You know, um, the sort of the worldview beliefs that are shaping that. Um, but for Māori, it's not like that at all. And I sort of feel like so exploring it theologically seems like it would be a really important piece to understanding it more holistically and more completely. Um, yeah, whereas for, I think, like I said, for Pākehā, I think that would often not, that's a piece that would often be left out of a conversation about public policy. Um, so I think that's um, really fascinating. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, adoption in general. I've heard, read that the early church was really big on adoption, Um uh, babies that were being abandoned um, in the Roman Empire, the church uh, had a practice of adopting those babies and taking them into their families, and that was sort of one of the um, things that really helped the church turn the Roman Empire upside down. Uh, what do you see going on in terms of adoption, both within the Māori community, Māori church, uh, Pākehā church? What do you just see happening in that space and and do you think that we should be moving more into, um, you know, widespread kind of practices of adoption in the church? Or 
Do you have any kind of thoughts about that? Yeah, I do think we should be moving into that. Mm. Um, it's in my experience, a little bit of a minority yeah. um, in the church. And I think, um, you know, talking about um, the idea around childless couples needing babies, there's a lot of focus on the adoption act and adopting babies in that sort of closed way. And adoption is actually much wider than that. Um, Fangai doesn't look at it that way. Um, you know, Fangai is about children and children may need to live somewhere or be cared for from by someone else for yeah. a time. Mm. And it doesn't matter what we call that. It's just about how, you know, children having um, a safe home and an environment. And, um, you know, sometimes uh, you find a lot of conversations in church around like, oh, wow, you adopted. That's great. How long did you wait? Right. And, um, you know, there's other ways of doing it. I mean, we have a brimming over foster system. There's always children that don't have places to go. We've got homes in every centre in New Zealand that have got, you know, like one couple looking after 20 teenagers because there's nowhere to put them. And right. So maybe adoption doesn't have to look exactly like adopting um, and sealing off the paperwork mm. under the Act mm. from the 50s. Maybe mm. it actually is just about making sure that all children have a, a home and are being raised. And so I think we need to widen our scope of what adoption means. Mm. Um, I'm pretty sure that, um, you know, when Paul talked about adoption, he wasn't meaning um, that, you know, you don't tell them where the parents are and it's a deathbed <laughs> yeah, yeah. secret. And yeah, yeah. it was just about um, making sure that everybody was, um, all the needs were met. Yeah. And so um, I don't know if we do that particularly mm. well either. Um, you know, we've got a bit of a problem in New Zealand with kids not being able to be at home and not really having anywhere to put them. Mm. Um, that's uh, kind of how our situation started. Um, our daughter initially was in foster care. Um, and, you know, I would wonder if more people, um, you know, Christians especially, could take a chance on that. And mm. um, maybe it's not just about filling an infertility need or taking mm. care of an orphan, or but maybe it's actually just about making sure that everybody's needs are met in society. Mm. And... Um, you know, having conversations around that. It's just um, the framework at the moment for adoption is quite rigid. It's mm. been quite rigid for a long time. And I just think maybe the scope for adoption needs to be a bit wider in people's minds. Yeah, yeah. And it may be not just about uh, an orphan, say, but it does seem to me like kind of a natural extension or application of that sort of um, biblical charge to care for widows and orphans, you know, the people that maybe, maybe need a family around them to, even if it's for a season, I, if I'm understanding you correctly, it might be for a season of this um, young person's life, but that you're sort of um, their support network, their their family, for want of a better word. Um, and I think... Um, Obviously, a lot of uh, Christians have sort of really hospitable homes. I don't know if that's um, something that is maybe more common when I was a kid, but I do know, you know, I can think of um, church folk who have had, um, you know, people coming in and out of their homes and uh, they'll have somebody living them with them for a few years, maybe a teenager or what have you that maybe didn't have a great family situation. And that kind of... Um, uh, willingness to be hospitable in quite a generous way and, and open your home up so that it extends beyond the sort of nuclear family or the biological family and bring on all these sort of um, waifs and strays maybe for want of a better phrase um, has been identified by um, Barna Group in, in the States as sort of one of the key components to a spiritually vibrant home, you know, that just mm -hmm. that radical hospitality that, yes, is people coming over for dinner, um, but it's also, hey, that teenager needs a place to live for a couple of years, so let's put them, let's convert a, a room out in the garage and, and put them in there for a while. Is that is that kind of getting a little bit at what you're talking about, having a wider view of what adoption is? Yes, because I think that is a little bit closer to the Whangai model. Mm. Um, you know, if there's um, somebody that needs something, everybody bands together and has a bit of a meeting and says, look, how are we going to make sure this person's needs are met? Mm. Who's got some resources to do so? Okay, so you're going to go over there and and it might not be forever. Um, it, it could be. Um, but it's it's not really about, um, you know, you or me or the child. It's about what actually works for everybody. We need to make sure that this person's taken care for. Um, and not just because they need something, but because we as a community need them. They're an asset to us. Every person is a Tonga. Mm. So, um, yeah, I just think maybe we need to 
look at it a little bit more like that mm. um, in the West and in the church. Um, and there are people doing that. You know, mm. we've met some really great people, and that's exactly their philosophy. Yeah. Um, you know, if there's a spare bed or a spare plate, then you know, you sleep or you get a mm. meal. Or, um, but yeah, I definitely think that um, maybe the focus needs to shift away a little bit from what we need and what you need and yeah. more about what works for everybody. Yeah, sure. I think um, just recently at my church, there's been an initiative for um, there to be sort of support networks around those few families who are in doing foster care. Mm -hmm. And um, But it's been all this time where, you know, foster parents have probably at some times maybe felt a little bit alone and now the church is starting to realise, oh, hey, we actually – We've got all these other families that can rally around you and be that sort of village, I guess, that raises that child. Um, I'm asking you to generalise a bit, um, but just thinking, you know, you've got this amazing um, perspective, uh, listening to Māori culture, thinking about it theologically with really practical kind of um, corollary, um, corollary, corollaries, corollary, corollaries, <laughs> um, outcomes, results, um, applications. Um, so how ready do you think New Zealand Pākehā, the church, is to hear these perspectives? Are you kind of hopeful that people are going to be receptive and are in that kind of place, or do you think we've got a, quite a bit of work before people are even going to listen? Yeah, that sort of changes depending on what I see on the internet that day. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think uh, we're ready in some ways. Um, I think that the um, the huge amount of stories coming out of the media around um, Māori children kind of yeah. begs us to do something mm. about it now. Mm. Um, you know, there's already talk about a Māori framework coming out around mm. that. Um, it's, you know, Whangai has operated... Um, basically illegally since the early 1900s. So, you know, we're looking at well over a century of um, operating in this legal grey area. There's no protection at all for Whangai children legally um, because your options are that you either take the child on um, under no legal framework and, um, you know, that child could go back um, when maybe that's not the best mm. um, or you conform to a Pākehā framework which um, breaches the treaty, basically. So I think we need to be talking about how to move forward with Whangai. There needs to be some sort of um, overhaul of the... It's crazy that we're still adopting under the 1955 Act. Yeah. Um, nothing on that Act has changed apart from in the 80s they said um, that you know, the release of information can now happen. Mm. Um, other than that, we're still operating under these very Victorian principles. And Māori have not um, changed their practice or behaviour in response to that in over 100 years. They have continued to um, feel convicted that what they're doing is good work mm. and that this is the way to do it. And, um, you know, when we see videos of um, babies being ripped out of mother's arms in the hospital... You can't wait. We, you know, how long do we keep mm. saying this is okay, um, this is not working, or um, putting the blame on things like, um, you know, you often see comments online like, oh well, if they just looked after their children, and you know, at, at what point do you say enough is enough, and we need to have a conversation about what is and wasn't, what isn't working here. Mm. Um, so uh, I don't know if people are ready, but um, Maori are definitely ready. It, mm. it needs to happen, um, and I think that anything that's um, Anything that doesn't look like moving forward is continuing to breach the treaty. Right. Cool. Well, that's really interesting, really fascinating, Taryn. I've We've spoken about your research before um, outside of this forum, but just being able to really press into it and hear more has been really enlightening for me, giving me heaps to think about. Like I said, it's really practical. It's, you know, a lot of theology feels really abstract and high-minded. I think here at Pathways and in the More Than Theology podcast, we're all about, you know, how do we actually apply this? And I, I really love that about what you're doing. It just has a very concrete, and like you said, a very timely kind of way of applying and, and playing out in, in Aotearoa at the moment. So thanks so much for being here. It's been a real delight to hear from you and um, get clean some of your wisdom. So cheers. Appreciate you being here. Cool. Thanks.